Good afternoon. I'm Stacey Leskin with the Los Angeles Times. Heartbleed has taken over our news feeds this week. But what is it, and how can you protect yourself from it? Tech reporter Chris O'Brien is here to answer all of your questions. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, happy to be here. So can you, OK, in Reddit terms, explain it to me like I'm five, because I am <laughs> having a very difficult time understanding exactly what Heartbleed is. Well, uh, it's a question I get a lot this week, unfortunately. So basically, there is an open source uh, security standard called OpenSSL that uh, a large percentage of websites have adopted across the internet to provide uh, a layer of encryption or sort of coding of your information that in theory will make it harder for people to capture that information and, uh, and steal your stuff. And so uh, what happened apparently a couple years ago, unknown to many folks, is that there was a mistake programmed into this security software that was then pushed out to all these websites and has been sort of out in the wild now for a couple of years. Uh, and this is called the heart, heart bleed bug. And so just a few weeks ago, some security re researchers discovered this thing and realized that essentially it meant that about two-thirds of all the websites in the world were vulnerable to fairly simple uh, hacker uh, exploits or sort of simple pieces of software someone could run that essentially let them download your user ID, your password, and lots of it, personal information. Mm. So this affects and websites so, like from your bank to your Facebook to apparently your Tumblr account, which is the first yes. website to announce this. Why, why does it have to come from a social media blogging platform versus you know, something kind of more serious? Because it seems like a big problem. Well, it is a big problem. And, and it sort of slowly has dawned on people the last couple of days. But uh, it's, it's seen as actually really an enormous problem mm. uh, that sort of cuts to our fundamental ability to trust uh, what we're doing online and feel secure when we step out into the internet. And the problem then becomes is that there's no sort of simple one-click fix for consumers out there. I mean, essentially, uh, you know, they have to, uh, you, you, everyone who's been emailing me the last couple of days asking, like, well, what do I do? What do I do? Mm -hmm. You know, there's not just a simple thing that you can do, like changing your password, that's going to solve the problem. It's it's a question of essentially remaining vigilant just about every time you go online. So really, though, what does that mean, remaining vigilant? Does that mean uh, periodically changing your passwords? Does it mean always changing your passwords every day, staying in an incognito window? How, what really can people do? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes, yes, and no. <laughs> um, so this is the thing. I mean, this is and this is where it gets frustrating. I think for people who have been reading our stories and sort of thinking, well, what do I do now? I mean, really, it means each time you go to a website, you've got to think to yourself, okay, what am I giving up or what am I doing uh, when I when I use this service? Mm. And then and then looking around or contacting that service and essentially saying, uh, are you guys vulnerable? Uh, what steps have you taken to fix the problem? Because you know, initially people were saying, well, just go change your password. But the thing is, if the site is still vulnerable and you change your password, then the people who have potentially breached the site just have your new password. So you haven't really uh, helped yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, this is where it gets frustrating. I mean, and it sounds like as much work as it really is to think like, okay, if I'm going to go banking at Wells Fargo, is there somewhere on the site that tells me that addresses this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my bank up here uh, in Silicon Valley has posted a link in a blog post saying, you know, we took a look at this, we're not using this, so we're not vulnerable and you're fine, but you might want to update your password anyways. Mm -hmm. But it's that kind of thing. I've had other people telling me, you know, they're calling customer service for all these services. They use one by one to ask them point blank, you know, are you vulnerable? Um, and you know, again, it's it's unsatisfying. Like you want it, you want so badly for there to be just sort of an easy, quick fix that lets you single-handedly deal with the issue mm -hmm. in one fell swoop, and then you kind of move on with your life. But that's what makes this problem so vexing. There just mm -hmm. isn't that kind of like you know one simple solution that's going to 
allow you just to not think about it anymore. Mm. We have one question too from Google Plus. Is OpenSSL an open source software? And if so, why is it used by big companies like Google? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, you know, it, it had demonstrated itself um, as, as a fairly secure, robust solution. And, you know, it has, <clears throat> uh, like, any, like many open source tools, of course, it has um, the, the virtue of being free. Mm. So, um, you know, you have this, this is the thing about where so, sort of security is at the moment that, you know, it's so complex and changing so fast and the threats are multiplying so quickly that I think there's some philosophy out there that says, okay, if we have this big open source tool and you have all these people contributing to it and you have this big community keeping their eyes on it, maybe that gives us kind of a big army to watch our back on that. Mm -hmm. You know, in this case, it sort of demonstrated the weakness of that approach because um, you probably didn't have the kind of rigorous testing and review that, say, um, you know, a, a public or private company for-profit would have engaged in before they released this code. Mm -hmm. We had one comment as well um, from LATimes.com on one of your stories. Uh, if you want to be real safe for accounts that hold your savings, perhaps a new temporary password now and change it again in a few more days after your institution announces they are safe from the exploit. Also, do not change it back to the password you used before. Is that enough? Um, I think it's enough for the short term. I mean, yeah, if you if you want to keep going in and changing your passwords repeatedly, that's mm. probably one way to be safe. They're probably not going to exploit you, uh, you know, within just a couple minutes or hours of going on a website. But, you know, again, it, it's come back to the same issue. Like, it's certainly a, a labor-intensive, relatively speaking, it's a, it's a labor-intensive approach to uh, solving the problem. And, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not a simple answer. And then another another comment as well saying, I don't get it. This is something that's been flawed for two years, mm -hmm. right? This is something that took two years. Why did it take so long for people to find this problem? Or do you think that they potentially, not to be a conspiracy theorist, but might have known about it and kept it hidden for a reason? Well, uh, it, that's this is, this is, again, what's so worrisome about mm. it. So, you know, again, because it's open source, there's not necessarily um, that sort of, Rig same rigorous ongoing um, review of the code or checking or double checking. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what happened was some independent researchers as well as some Google researchers discovered this just a few weeks ago because, you know, these companies employ people that essentially go around looking for holes and bugs and flaws and software and uh, not just that they use but that uh, other companies make and other people use. Mm -hmm. And so they, they sort of simultaneously came across this. Mm. Um, and what's, again, what's just unknown is whether people have in fact been exploiting this for two years or whether, in, if, in a sense, it was the publicity that brought it to the attention mm. of hackers around the world. Ironically, of course, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, you warn everybody to be careful and that at the same time, you know, raises the flag and it puts a target on everyone's back for, mm. you know, people looking for something to attack. So um, I, I think they, once they did, these groups discovered it, um, I think they did move quickly to alert people and to alert the open source, mm -hmm. source community. But again, that's just it's just one of the scary things about it. We just simply don't know how widely people have been exploiting this, if they've been exploiting mm -hmm. it for the last couple of years. And you had a piece, too, about companies, how this is really just ruining the trust that they have built up with customers over the years for using their Internet products. What can companies really do to instill that trust again with their consumers? Well, I think the key is to be really transparent. I mean, make you get the information we're talking about, asking people to go in search of. Mm -hmm. um, it should be right there on your homepage. You know, you should say straight up, you know, yes, we've been affected. No, we've not been affected. If we've been affected, here's what we've done uh, to fix the problem. Here's what you should do. Mm -hmm. um, and and here's if there was a breach or information lost. Here's here's what's happened and who was affected by that. And lastly, you and another tech reporter, Sal Rodriguez, wrote a piece about a website people can use to check if websites are affected by Heartbleed. What is that website again and how can people access it? And how should they really be using it properly? 
Yeah, uh, and I'm sorry because the URL is going to escape me right now. Um, but yes, there are there are actually several sites now that have popped up that will let you check that um, to see if a website is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to be on the lookout for, and and some of the you know I, I recognize some of the jargon and technology we're talking about can be a little obscure for folks, but if you if you're surfing the internet. And you go to a website, and in the in the browser address bar, you see a little green padlock, uh, and then the letters HTTPS. That's an indication, possibly, that they're using Open SSL on their site. Um, and again, and ironically, that was supposed to be uh, an icon that you saw that sort of reassured you that you know you're getting extra security when you come to the site. But take a look when you visit a site to see if that's up there. And if it is, that might be an indication that you particularly want to be um, in search of information that indicates whether they've addressed this update and taken some steps to uh, discover whether they've been vulnerable or whether they've patched the issue. Great. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time and explaining this to me like I'm five. I think I have a much better understanding <laughs> of all of the steps I need to take, and I'll be changing all of my passwords right after this chat. And if you guys want more information, make sure to visit us at LATimes.com where you can see all of Chris's pieces as well as the websites to visit to check all of your favorite all of your favorite sites. And also tweet Chris your questions at O'Brien on Twitter. And for more news and information, visit us at LATimes.com.